of Africa is still so segregated? Let me tell you, because 90% of the viable land that is uh, workable for agricultural production and the most expensive land is owned by 10% of the population, which is white people. White people own most of the fucking land still in South Africa that Bobby, is yeah. viable Bobby for agricultural has. production. And, uh, and they still make up only 10% of the population, whereas 90% of the population is black and own only 10% of the land. That's why the segregation has never really ended um, because of the uh, fucking apartheid state uh, that was uh, never fully upended. Hi. Here we go. More anti-white slander. Yes, exactly. White people just own that land and they deserve it because uh, they took it. Uh, they strong armed it and they took it. So, uh, you know, it's anti-white slander to literally point out a statistical anomaly that was purposely designed as a consequence of what we know as the apartheid. I find that very strange that you're literally looking at something like this. Me just Asshole. saying factually correct statements about uh, South Africa and land ownership in South Africa is immediately assumed as anti-white by you. And the reason why you immediately assume that it's anti-white is because you recognize that that is really fucking unequal. Okay? So it must be anti-white. Okay, uh, before we move on, before we continue with this video, though, I will be uh, running another ad break here. because This strip in Cape Town, South Africa, divides the beachside community of Strand from the township of Nomzamo. They're only a few meters apart, but the people on each side live very different lives. Strand has backyards and driveways. Nomzamo is much more dense, and the people here have fewer basic services. Less piped water, less internet access, and Nanzamo is majority black, while the area across the line is majority white. If we use dots on a map to represent race, you can see how stark that divide is. If we zoom out to the whole city, we can see it's actually everywhere. And this is the case across much of South Africa. The color of your skin here often determines where you live. It also determines your quality of life. This map shows where jobs and opportunities are primarily concentrated in Cape Town. And this is where most of the city's black people Happy live, in long. informal settlements called townships on the city's periphery. People have to move by public transport for up to three hours. By the way, the irony here is this is literally how most major American cities are built as well. I'm just going to let you know. Obviously, the income inequality is not as severe or could be as severe, actually, in certain places. But most American cities are built in this exact identical fashion as a consequence of redlining. Hours a day and they can't take care of their obligations in the community with the rest of the family because they're always working and they're always traveling. For decades, South Africa was under apartheid, a system that wrote segregation into hassle, law. Hassle, hassle. A white minority controlled where non-white people could live, work, exist. Many were forced out of their homes. In 1994, a democratically elected government yeah, took power and schools. ended you, apartheid. Sam. It was supposed to be a new beginning. But a lot of the country still looks like this. And that's because South Africa's legacy of it's racial division goes back centuries. In the 1600s, the Dutch took over the southern tip of Africa to supply ships with food along the trade route to Asia. Colored means mixed, right? In uh, South Africa, like Trevor Noah is considered colored, right? Not black and not white. Yeah. 150 years later, Britain seized it and named it Cape Colony. I'm not touching that, that one, back. lol. No, like literally, that's... Uh, Americans are probably confused because there's like a specific designation in this list right here where it literally says colored. And you're like, what the fuck box. does that mean? Well, it means that you're... That's the, uh, that's the definition for... Uh, being mixed, uh, like half black, half white, or it just means like you're mixed race. V 
super strange, but here Dutch we are. Dutch colonists moved here, further inland, to escape British rule and continue exploiting enslaved people. Just like the Dutch, the British used Cape Colony as a strategic location for trade. It wasn't economically significant. But in the 1870s, that changed when the British started mining diamonds there. Suddenly, Cape Colony was one of Britain's most prized and exploited colonies. In order to get the diamonds out of the country, they built railways to connect the mines up here to the coast. The railways allowed the British to access a global diamond market through the port city of Cape Town. Soon, the economy of Cape Colony was centered around the railroads, especially this main route. The green areas on this map show the black regions of Cape Colony, largely left out of the railroad economy. Racial inequality in Cape Colony was being reinforced by a location. To keep it that way, the colonial government I wonder why. That's so strange. It's almost like, uh, I mean, there could be no reason for this, right? Uh, very, very different here in the United States, like when they built literally fucking highways around black neighborhoods in a similar capacity, by the way. ...started writing segregation into law. The Native Lands Act of 1913 pushed black people into these areas, only 8% of South Africa's land, and restricted them from owning land everywhere else. Or relocated them to the edges of the major cities to work for white people. These laws began to shape the region. Cape Town's growth from the increased trade turned the port town into a major city. Many migrants from the rest of the colony and elsewhere moved here, to what was then the outskirts of Cape Town, where former enslaved people, merchants, artists, and immigrants were forming a neighborhood called District 6. As the city grew around District 6, so did the neighborhood. For decades, District 6 was a thriving, integrated community. We were a very cosmopolitan, you could say family almost, because there were people from all different nationalities, from all different walks of life. This was the statement, your child is my child. But it wouldn't last. By the way, this is love low you. QI, I love District 9 and also uh, Elysium as well. These dudes, they're like South African movie makers are pretty good at uh, showcasing economic inequality and racial disparities from the immediate, very clear and very immediate fucking uh, experiences that they've had growing up. In 1934, Britain's legal hold in what was now the Union of South Africa officially ended. The remaining white minority, the descendants of Dutch I never watched Chappie, I have control. no idea. And they built on I the foundation the British were leaving behind. Between 1949 and, and 1971, the all-white government passed 148 laws solidifying apartheid. Apartheid allowed for the full realization of the ambition of the fascist project in South Africa. In 1950, the Population Registration Act officially classified people by race. Yeah, I love Neil Long White, Camp. colored, and native or black, and eventually Asian. Then they made laws saying where people could live. Around the country, black South Africans were moved into these areas, called homelands or Bantustans. Bantustans were rural areas and had underdeveloped economies. Many of them were in the areas Britain had already excluded from the railway economy and where black land ownership had been restricted to. Black people were forced to carry passbooks that specified where they were allowed to work or travel to. In cities like Cape Town, the Group Areas Act moved the remaining non-whites into separate urban areas. The most prime land and the land closest to high-valued property was allocated to white people. In 1966, the government declared that District 6 was now a whites-only area. The residents of District 6 received removal letters like this one that said living there was illegal because they were not white. Bulldozers drove into District 6 and razed it to the ground. 
We loved you. We had a life here. That's what so strange. Um, I mean, stuff like this never happens, right? Uh, anymore, obviously, because, you know, racism was made illegal. Um, you know, except, oh, wait, that's literally what's going on in Palestine right now. Okay, cool. It's very traumatic for a lot of people. It's like ripping out someone's heart. More than 60,000 wow, wow. people were forcibly removed from their homes. This kind of violence against non-white people was commonplace around the country. But after decades of pressure, both from within South Africa and abroad, apartheid rule finally came to an end. The new government lifted restrictions on where people could live. Millions of people who had been excluded from economic development for centuries migrated to major cities looking for basic services and economic opportunity. For any family with no prospect of employment, the most rational, logical choice to make is to migrate to an urban center. They settled where there was empty land, creating townships on the peripheries of major cities, like Cape Town. The government built millions of homes and expanded clean water and electricity. But it had a number of unforeseen consequences, the most important of which is that the only land that could be used for the public housing program was on the periphery of the city. And for that reason, a brilliant intention to overcome the apartheid legacy unintentionally reproduced the very same legacy it was trying to undo. Today, 60% of the mostly Black population of Cape Town lives in these townships at the edge of the city. The thing is, Cape Town's city center has land to develop. But because of its location, it's valuable. So it usually gets sold to private developers who build luxury apartments. Nearly a billion dollars worth of them are going up by the coast. But right in the heart of Cape Town, by all the expensive developments, District 6 remains largely untouched. The former residents have fought against private development, and they've actually succeeded. Some have even managed to return to houses built by the city. I wanted to, to, to come back uh, here where I was born, which was part of uh, our family's heritage. I couldn't believe that I was back. It was a sense of relief. But there are still hundreds of claimants waiting to get back to District 6. We haven't done the difficult and the painful work to confront what the intergenerational consequences are of colonialism, of apartheid, the story of Cape Town and South Africa's racial segregation starts far in the past, but it's very much entangled with the present. Apartheid and colonialism here are over, but many of the barriers they built have yet to be dismantled. The kind of psychic scars that's left on the individuals and on communities, we haven't begun the work of saying, how do we live together, right? In the face of that history, There you go. It's so bad in South Africa right now. White people only take up 9, 8% of the population, but almost 80% of public land. Yeah. So that's it. That's, that's the, that's the part of the uh, problem. And any sort of like uh, expropriation uh, argument is considered to be one communist and two, uh, actually the real segregation or the real racism so hope everyone is chat is having a great day okay um tim pool explains how he became a disaffected liberal i kind of don't want to watch this shit to be honest 